Um, uh, does the clerk call the meeting to order? Or do I call that? I call the meeting to order. One day I won't be entirely new. Yes. Okay, I'm calling the meeting uh, to order. This is the uh, City Schools Liaison Committee meeting of June 15th, 2023. And uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Chair Lipcott Hanks. Here. Council Member Burt. Here. Board Member Collins. Here. Board Member Yara. Here. All, right. All present. Thank you. I'm just realizing that I don't have a mic in front of me, so I'm figuring if this one. I should take this one. Then do you yes, have one? Yes, actually, the owl is recording us and it does a pretty good job. Oh, it does it? Okay. Well. Perfect. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, you could sit right there. That's perfect. Okay. And I also uh, uh, like to have staff introduce themselves. So um, let's just go around the table. Let's start here with Ms. Uh, Cotton Gaines. Hello, Chantal Cotton Gaines, Deputy City Manager, City Hall. John Austin, Superintendent. Um, I'm Alice Shambayati. I'm the admin for the city clerk's office and also serving as clerk for this meeting. Terrific, thank you. Okay, let's go to public comments for anything not on the agenda. Yes. Oh, hi. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ken Horowitz. Good morning. Been a resident for 40, 40 some odd years. Uh, I didn't see Coverly on the but on the agenda, so I just wanted to share my thoughts on, on Coverly again and why I'm so passionate about it. Um, and you know, I was looking at a couple of our city, uh, our, our other cities in the county here, um, Mountain View, just. Um, uh, re, 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 uh, renovated uh, their community center. It's 32,000 square feet. That was um, done in 2019. Also, the San Mateo County Burlingame has a new community center. It's now 30 feet. So I'm trying to figure out how we in Palo Alto just can't get it done, community center, why we can't get it done. Um, and I think the responsibility goes, you know, across the board, both the city and the school district. Um, one, um, the school district has been able to kind of board this building uh, for so long because the city has agreed to pay rent and do all the maintenance work and the other things that related to, to Coverly. And um, also the school district, uh, when they did decide to go for parcel taxes, never included um, Coverly in their um, infrastructure plans. So I'm hopeful that we can move forward in the next few years. And I had a couple of suggestions, um, and I'm sorry that our city manager is not here, but I, I, I really believe that um, Director O'Kane should not be um, on this project. I don't think she's qualified and maybe she has too much on her plate, but I think we need to have some person in the city office that uh, really understands what's going on with Coverly and all the expenses associated with it. And that's why I thought, secondly, maybe there needs to be some sort of auditor that kind of looks at all the expenses related to Coverly, both the capital expenses and the basic expenses. A lot of money is going out from the city to the school district. Um, and uh, I noticed that on the budget, on the agenda for the city council next week, there are three items related to the school district. One is uh, a modular restroom. Another is 700, 000, $707,000 for extended day daycare lease. And then there's another million dollars we're related to athletic field brokerage. So I'm hopeful that some, somebody can go through all of the numbers and really find out what the city is giving to the school district. Thank you for your time. Perfect. Well, time, public comment. Thank you. Show of veteran. <laughs> okay, with public comment behind us, uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes from our prior meeting? So moved. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Thank you. And now we'll move to our city and district reports. And I'd like to invite the district to go first. Uh, we're 
almost to our last meeting of the year. That's next next Tuesday. We'll have final approval on our PAUSD promise, which is um, in some places a strategic plan, but it's more actionable and, and uh, more more focused. Um, we will also uh, be looking forward to getting our state testing results back um, and going through those before our first meeting of the new year, which will be uh, about the third week in August, especially interested in our reading results since all indications are that we've made unparalleled and unprecedented uh, growth in reading for the second year in a row. So we're, we're encouraged that in places where we had uh, historically struggled, historically means forever in this case, that we are really showing an ability to impact things when we focus intently and uh, have unwavering commitment. So we're excited about, about that. And the uh, last meeting of the year, we'll also approve our, our budget um, for the year. And again, we're in, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, we're in actually, we're in excellent shape, uh, but we do have some additions. We uh, made late additions for an additional 12 uh, employees to help us with student behavior, uh, uh, training with, with teachers and with actually uh, modeling how to uh, promote better behavior with, with students in our, in our schools. And then just even yesterday, we uh, uh, talked about doing some additional staffing things around the area of special ed, which will include leveraging our classified staff differently, something that our um, our CSTA president has advocated for for a long time. So I had a very nice meeting with her last night. She's pretty excited. So optimism is good heading into next year. We're uh, fully staffed at the administrative level, and we have just a couple of vacancies left heading into next year. So I feel pretty good. Thank you. Anything to add from the trustees? Well, just... <laughs> I'll just follow up and say um, the reading scores that Dr. Austin mentioned, uh, those were um, literacy scores where the district exceeded, rather the students exceeded the benchmark set by the board um, in, in all subjects. So it can't really overstate how, um, how excited that board members all were to see that progress as a continuing step on, on our journey to addressing literacy. Pray is to close the proceeding. And then mental health, you know, we have these ad hoc committees that um, we work with over the course of the year and they give us reports and, and the ad hoc committee for mental health gave us report as, as did the ad hoc committee for dual enrollment, both areas that are of uh, really great importance, mental health, you know, having restructured our mental health to bring it in-house the the work over the next few years is going to be implementing and making sure that you know we're providing resources and, and identifying what resources we need to provide internally uh, and with dual enrollment again in the vein of uh, broadening pathways for to serve every student the dual enrollment committee um, produced some recommendations that were targeted towards strengthening our dual enrollment uh, process for the school district so it's on the dual enrollment dual enrollment is where uh, we work with Foothill, for example, and students can take classes through Foothill as well as at high school, and that gives them a greater range of courses they can take in addition to getting credit. And helps low-income kids in particular for first-time or first-gen kids with an on-ramp to college that they can start class-free while they're still enrolled in high school. Right. Anything else? Um, I just, I mean, we talk a lot about reading. I just want to back up because I. We, we think everybody pays a lot of attention to us and know what we're talking about, and obviously they don't. Um, so you, you are all aware, we started about two years ago with an uh, initiative that came to be called the Every Student Reads Initiative with a focus on having all students at grade, all students, every student at grade level in reading by third grade, um, which is a real important um, uh, milestone in students uh, academic career and life career and there's a lot of analysis a lot of evidence around students who are not don't achieve that milestone often never catch up struggle throughout school struggle throughout life so it has been and i give you know dr austin and his team you know great kudos for this because 
they've really elevated uh, this initiative in a way that I've never seen an initiative elevated. Where where we like most public agencies, and I'm sure you guys can sympathize, get a lot of pressure to do a lot of things, so it's hard to say no and hard to say we're going to focus on one thing for a long period of time to the exclusion of other things. Um, but that's what we've done. We've made this the top priority, and I think Dr. Austin's done an exceptional job of kind of pushing that through the organization. No, no one in the and the school community, staff, families who's paying attention at all is, would miss the fact that this is our top priority. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we talk about it, and we, you know, you can hear the pride in um, Mr. Darf's voice and my own too. It's, uh, you know, this is a big deal because we think this is a really, really important thing. As Dr. Austin mentioned, we've been really, really bad at it. Um, when we first started this journey, uh, Palo Alto was, you know, we think of ourselves as the number one school district in California. We were in fact in the bottom 5% of all school districts in California for third grade achievement for low income Latino students. So, you know, there was a big disconnect between our self understanding and what we were actually accomplishing. And so, and that, while that's that's startling to hear, it's not a surprise because we all know that that's been the case for a long time. So, you know, to actually see progress on this is, I think, you know, hopeful. I don't want to jinx it by, you know, this was the internal, this was the internal assessment. The state assessment comes in a, you know, uh, in the fall, as Dr. Austin mentioned, and that, that's probably the one we pay more attention to. But I did want to give you the context that this is something that's been going on for a while and I expect will continue to go on for a while as we try to, you know, kind of lay a foundation for a, a better DAUSD. Terrific. Questions, comments from my city colleagues? Um, well, I'll add my congratulations to you on uh, what you've achieved over these last two years with uh, your literacy efforts and can hear the pride in your voice and really commend you for what you're able to do. And Todd, uh, I really appreciate your bringing in the history um, that for a public agency, it's hard to focus on any one thing. There's so many priorities and you all have managed to really center this one and you've achieved results dramatically exceeding, I think your own expectations even this quickly, that's what I perceive. So um, huge kudos to you. And of course we can be proud um, to be a part of the city where the school district has done this. So congratulations. Um, I think in the future, I would love to sit down with somebody to talk about the process for how you managed to achieve that, how you managed it whittle down and narrow and focus on this particular priority. Um, it's something I certainly can learn from. So um, I would like to go back to the, when you, uh, to Dawn, you mentioned the final approval of the PAUSD promise. Mm -hmm. And just for those who may not be aware of what that is, if you could give us a few bullets on sure. what comes on that. Yeah, so well, school district has um, a breadth of programs unlike anything I've ever seen. I mean, what we do here as far as what we offer students, uh, I've just never been in a place that could do that. And I've been in some very high achieving places. So that part has always been in place. What has not been in place is the elevator uh, talk of what, what are the top priorities. Everything cannot be a top priority or anytime you add an and or a comma, um, you're you're weakening, you're whittling down the importance of those things that you said were important. Um, so really, the focus here has been intense and it's been great. And um, you know, ment mental health is uh, one of our five top priority areas, and it's it's going to get more attention. Um, the the more I look around and and in our stakeholders look around, the more apparent it is that we. Because we haven't had the kind of issues and, and events that this town has had in a while, doesn't mean everything's fixed. It could even be worse as a whole. Um, I think there's a lot of contributing factors to that, not important for right now, but mental health will remain a, a, a top priority. We did add in this year, and by add, I mean we took something out to put something in. We'll never have more than five priority goals. Uh, innovation 
We're excited about that. Dr. Uh, Zhang Che is um, leading a lot of those efforts. And we are, we're really putting together some exciting partnerships with Stanford um, that we'll probably be able to announce by the early fall. Um, but I don't think it's any, uh, any uh, shocker that we will be talking to them about partnerships around sustainability. Uh, so sustainability and mental health efforts are both just complete natural uh, fits. Um, our, our work on equity, equity and excellence will remain a, a uh, PAUSD promise goals as well. Um, early literacy and then to serve and celebrate others. Uh, again, the idea of, of giving and being something bigger and positive for other people needs to remain a priority. It's, it's a deficiency. Uh, not just in Palo Alto, but I think across the entire country right now, things are so polarized and decisions are boiled down to binary that we need to really think about how we can treat people better and celebrate successes. Uh, so those are our five priority goals. The, the best part about that is this is year three or four with the PAUSD promise, maybe three. Yeah. Um, and four of the five goals have remained Targets. I mean, the, the topics have remained unchanged and only one has changed. That speaks to stability and that every year you don't need to come up with a brand new set of, oh, and this year we're going to do this thing. That has been the enemy uh, in Palo Alto, probably as much as anything. The idea that every year you have to have a new idea and uh, again, dilutes, dilutes our efforts. So yeah, we're coming we're really good. It makes the conversations easier. Uh, when you go in with a group, you know what one of the five topics are that you're probably going to be spending the bulk of your time on, and it's easier to align our resources um, with the most important resource not being our money, but our our time and energy. So that's it. And just one very minor, uh, but I that was well very well put. Um, I do think we we tried to pick problems or priority areas, I should say, that the idea that you would take care of it in a year is impossible. I mean, it's just not, it wouldn't be relevant to say this will be a priority this year, but next year we're not going to care about reading. Next year we'll care about math, you know, and then something else. It's like, so we've, we've kind of acknowledged that the big, we should be taking on the big problems. We should make them the priority and that it's going to take a while. You know, and I tend to, you know, my mental model is if these things are a priority for three to five years, that's probably about right. Um, so, um, it, and it does lend a really nice organization-wide stability because if you're a teacher or a student or a parent and you're saying, what what are those guys up to? It's not like, oh, yeah, that was from two years ago. I guess it's something else now. It's, it's been a lot of continuity about these are our top priorities. Right. It, that makes us perfect. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that from the district. And to my city colleagues, who'd like to go first on our report? Thank you. Sure, I just have a very, very quick one, which is a more public service announcement. <laughs> and then I know you all will fill them in on all the things I'll go through. Um, our Municipal Service Center Open House, which is a big community event opportunity for folks to interact with city staff, um, get to see the operations and play, just like big trucks. You can all <laughs> come just for that. Um, it'll be taking place uh, Saturday, July 15th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at our Municipal Services Center out on Bayshore. And so um, that's a great community event. I really encourage everyone to check it out. So that's my only small update. And a lot of the other things uh, have to do with the actual actions of the City Council. So that's why we can you know, hold them in on that. And our budget um, adoption is coming up next Monday. So that's a good Julie, do you want to do your list first and I'll chime in with others? Um, I would prefer that you go, actually. Well, I don't want to step on all your toes. So. <coughs> on my toes? Well, by uh, covering things that maybe you want to cover. No, it's fine. I would prefer that you go. I, uh, I'll fill in if, I, if you've not said anything. Okay. Uh, I guess I don't believe really that. Um, so, uh, as Chantel mentioned, we have um, uh, our budget wrapping up. Um, we have a few final decisions that the council actually has to make on what are called tier two items, ones where we have um, a, uh, 
a moderate amount of funding to cover uh, a bunch of items that were not uh, in the city manager's budget and really that the council um, uh, is able to prioritize and the finance committee has narrowed that down. Um, we actually have taken a little more aggressive uh, position in terms of anticipated revenues and expenses uh, and said, well, um, we've recommended a, a bigger portion of that, let's call this tier two list of uh, priorities. Uh, but in the whole, um, our budget uh, is, uh, is strong and uh, really we're, we're able to have restored the services that were slashed in 2020 um, and, um, and actually added some new initiatives. Uh, which uh, is a big transformation. Uh, now, all, not all of the positions that we have authorized have we yet been able to fill. So um, uh, we've restored them in the budget, uh, but that doesn't mean that we restored them all um, uh, with uh, boots on the ground. And one that, a relatively small one that came up um, during the, um, the budget process, but um, uh, was of interest to the uh, uh, Julie and Greer and I on the on the finance committee is that our teen center and this is one that I should say Anne has presumably interest to the district. Our teen center has not had the staffing to enable the Sub Mitchell Park Teen Center to enable regular hours since uh, the cut in 2020, and uh, so we have no regular hours in the teen center still. I thought they were at limited hours and restoring them and none. Uh, and a big part of the problem has been able to hire the people uh, to fill that. Uh, apparently, and we don't have full knowledge on this history, um, uh, a lot of the staffing had been by um, elder teens for middle schoolers, some things like that that is supported. Um, we were, once we found that out, I think we as a council think that there are ways to solve that problem. And one that Greer brought up uh, is classified employees uh, from the district who might be interested in uh, moving over to their after school hours, maybe walk a couple hundred yards in some cases, uh, and um, and uh, uh, because they're they're skilled and have the same sort of orientation that uh, we have in the teen center. So just want to mention that, um, and um, and then we. Um, we also uh, just last week approved the, uh, on Monday, this week, I should say, approved the uh, Life Moves uh, Transitional Housing Project, which includes um, uh, a sizable portion for families. So this is unhoused families. And um, uh, it's a pretty transformative step. Um, in Mountain View, uh, their facility that's now uh, been open close to three years. Um, they uh, appear to have reduced their uh, homeless population by a little over 40%, uh, primarily as a result of this facility. Um, and, um, and we will have uh, families there. Now, uh, some of these, the way it's set up, those families will be able to uh, attend any schools that they've been attending, uh, but they're also, um, uh, uh, the most adjacent school will be Palo Verde across our 101 bike bridge. Um, and so just wanted to get that on, in your thinking on, on how we will collectively address that. Um, and they have, the facility has full wraparound services, three meals a day provided, medical services on site, social services, and then ideally transition to permanent housing. Uh, but one of the concerns is um, whether these residents who are often working in Palo Alto will have um, access to permanent housing in Palo Alto. And um, we do have coming up, uh, uh, just going to our architectural review board, the Charities Housing Project on El Camino. So in addition to our other affordable housing projects in the pipeline, this one correlates to the uh, transitional housing because it provides extremely low and very low income housing once it's built, uh, which is those sorts of income levels that could transition people from the Life Moves Project into permanent housing. 
Um, now it's it's going to not the Life Moves project will break ground next month, we believe. The uh, even though the Carries Housing project, um, which includes uh, family and singles, just like the Life Moves does, um, it's going through the approval process. Uh, it's going to take some time because uh, once they have their entitlements, they still have fundraising and construction to do. The fundraising is also on each of these projects is uh, enabled in part by our business tax, where we dedicated one third of that revenue toward uh, affordable housing, which um, along your point earlier, um, this is a um, council priority that we have carried over as affordable housing the last couple of years. And we have now um, essentially five affordable housing projects in the pipeline. That's on top of something that is not widely known, and we've been remiss as a community to not make it more widely known. But uh, on a per capita basis, Palo Alto has the highest proportion of a, a deed restricted affordable housing of any city in the county. And on as a percentage of housing units, only Gilroy is ahead of us. So we're, we and Gilroy are the two leaders in the entire county. We have on a per capita basis. Uh, well over twice as many units as Mountain View, for instance. And even though Mountain View has been put forward as this sort of model of housing, they've actually in recent years had lost its in affordable housing from displacement um, and drastic increases in demand for it from job creation. So we think we're on a good track on, on uh, that uh, whole direction. Uh, on a livelier note, um, we also That's have yeah, uh, more fun and lively. We have our summer concert series. We've had our first two concerts. Oh, wow. And then um, we have tonight the second of our third Thursdays on California Avenue, which for those who don't know, it, uh, this, is, this one is combined with World Music Day, and we're going to have nine bands, I think it is. Uh, a month ago, the opening, we had four bands and about 1,500 people on California Avenue on Thursday evening. Uh, it's quite an event. Uh, and um, so we're excited about that. And if you haven't seen, we now have there and on Ramona uh, street furniture and games. We have, you know, um, uh, life size uh, chess boards um, and team games. There's been a real deliberate effort to have. Um, activities for youth there. Um, and so uh, that may be of additional interest to you. Um, and then we also um, just uh, a week ago adopted what had been in the works for a couple of years, which is additional renter protections, uh, limiting uh, deposit sizes and um, and um, and greater uh, protections on uh, just cause eviction which not only affects all renters, but uh, low-income families in our community, which uh, that's a real burden. Um, and um, just one other note on, on related to uh, the broad spectrum of youth mental health, um, we're uh, uh, one aspect of uh, mean street restrictions on the track has been the fencing and an interest in completing that may know that uh, Congresswomen uh, Eshoo and Spear had uh, got put forward $800,000 to Caltrain for additional fencing, uh, not exclusively in Palo Alto, but it was very much with a uh, priority on Palo Alto within that. That funding um, should show up to Caltrain in about six months, and we're starting discussions on uh, really planning so that we can take advantage of it as soon as the dollars arise. Um, so that's going to be um, a good opportunity there. And lastly, on your uh, sustainability and uh, efforts, um, um, we just uh, adopted our uh, three-year work plan uh, of goals and key actions along with, uh, in the fall, we had basically adopted them in principle along with reach, what are called reach code updates. Uh, but we had to go through a uh, secret process before we could officially adopt them and we, we refined them somewhat in the meantime. It's a very aggressive program uh, that we have. And it's really um, 
we're one of the leading cities anywhere in terms of um, uh, 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 comprehensive model programs that are designed to take us to our 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030, which is uh, far ahead of the state and ahead of almost any other uh, initiative. Um, uh, and we actually have been making good progress again. We had kind of stalled out after our initial progress when we went to carbon neutral electricity. And now with this program, we're really ramping up. Um, and as you probably know, our first real scaling uh, effort on buildings is this heat pump water heater replacement. Um, I have been pushing and would like to engage more with the district in that as we look at how do we really transform um, the uh, citizenry embracing what is a right now not a mandatory program but a very strong one where we make it as simple as possible uh, to transition upon end of life of your hot water heater, not upon what's called burnout, which is when it conks out and you have no water, hot water and you don't have time to transition to electric. It is identifying uh, when you've only got a couple of years left on the hot water heater and we'll do everything in on-bill financing and, and turnkey operation. But how do we approach and really uh, break through to as broad of a populace as we can in driving this transition. And I believe that the students demanding this of their parents and their grandparents is one of the most effective and underutilized methods that we can have. And that's what I'm particularly interested in collaborating with the district on is uh, who can really apply the leverage on folks who maybe are on the edge and studies going back have shown that 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 voice and this this applies not just in liberal affluent areas like Palo Alto but in uh, more conservative areas uh, parents and grandparents listen to their kids and their kids asserting uh, that this is an existential threat to their future so I think there's that's one area of collaboration uh, there are others in our our sustainability and climate action plan that I think we we could really work together on. Um, and uh, lastly, we um, um, we just had our uh, study session and um, on extension of our animal shelter. Um, it's a it's a dilemma. Uh, we've had struggles with the uh, the uh, nonprofit that had taken it over a few years ago, but it looks like we're going to continue with them uh, and try to uh, work through the uh, the uh, uh, refinements that need to be done to make it work at a higher cost to the city. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Pat. I'll add, um, uh, with respect to Coverly Process, which was raised in a public comment uh, progress, uh, I believe we are scheduled for a closed session at the City Council in August. Um, and I know we're all looking forward to having that conversation. Um, speaking of students, um, the Palo Alto Student Climate Coalition is, uh, I don't know if they come to your meetings as often as they come to ours. Yeah, um, they are a phenomenal group of students in Palo Alto who speak regularly about climate mm -hmm. and speak with such knowledge. They've done their research. They have formulated terrific and persuasive arguments. And um, they're a shining example of uh, what youth in the city are about and what they can achieve um, when they are passionate about an issue. Um, there's another set of students um, that I've come to know recently, the Gun Gay Straight Alliance. Uh, and I met recently in advance of Pride Month. I was just seeking to understand from them what their priorities were. And they let me know that um, that middle school students in the Palta Unified feel safe being out as queer students in middle school, which is a phenomenal transformation societally. I think when, when we were all young, uh, people weren't coming out in middle school. They weren't coming out in high school. They were barely coming out in college. And we have advanced to this place where kids feel safe. And middle schoolers are asking, what high school should I go to? What high school will be a safe place for me to be myself. And so these 
high school students had done in the Gay Straight Alliance were saying, could we put on a forum for middle school or for eighth graders um, in January to March of the eighth grade year where say at Mitchell Park, every high school comes with uh, a table where you can learn about the resources, what is the library doing? What are the mental health supports? Is there a club? Uh, maybe a panel where a representative from each high school, public and private in the area, could could sort of speak up about what it's like to be um, queer on that campus. And I just thought, my goodness, what a marvelous marvelous example! These high schoolers so interested in helping middle schoolers um, access the information they need so that they can make the right school choice for them. I just thought it was beautiful. Um, I do want to add that we had um, at our most recent meeting, we had the report of our independent police auditor. This is something our city does. Uh, uh, we are the only city in Santa Clara County besides San Jose that has an independent police auditor. It is unusual uh, for a city of our size, but we do it because we care about um, transparency and accountability and policing. And um, so we had a terrific report on Monday and um, I want to also add that our police department has put up their RIPA data, the Racial Identity and Profiling Act uh, data is now on the police department website. It's a tremendously interactive resource where you can sort by all kinds of variables and understand, you know, who's being who's being approached by police, for what reason, what is the outcome, um, and what are the demographics of those people. So I I encourage us as a community to be interested in these data. Um, Chief Bender has indicated he plans to bring uh, an analyst on board uh, who can help us. It's one thing to have access to all this data, but making sense of a complex data set is incredibly challenging. And he knows that. And he wants to um, be sure that we have the capacity as a community to actually understand what these data mean and interrogate them uh, thoughtfully. So that feels really good. And um, it was great to hear the district say that you are collaborating with Stanford on a number of things. And we too uh, have uh, some conversations coming up with Stanford. We have formed the Stanford Ad Hoc Committee of the City Council. We're meeting with them uh, the day after their graduation. Uh, uh, that's next Monday and uh, this Monday. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to uh, think of uh, ways in which we can explore uh, really potentially promising collaborations uh, with this important institution right up the road. Uh, and delighted to hear that that you're um, you know, in, in good relationship with them as well. Good. Any questions, anything to add, Ms. Cotton Gaines, now that you've heard, did we leave out anything that you would have said? I think you posted okay. okay. Questions and comments for us? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of small things. Yeah. On Stanford, I mean, I don't, I, I guess we have a collaboration with them the main thing we talked to them about is money. Um, uh, uh, and I assume you guys will be doing the same because while there are things that we can and do do with them, um, one of the biggest issues that is, you know, that's the reality of our collective situation is they are not a tax paying entity and they use city services and school district services and, and they grow and they grow. So we've been working on that you know, for many years, in fact, it's gonna come up with a presentation that I'll share in a little bit, some data three there. Um, but our ongoing conversations are, money's an important part of it. And I'd encourage, I mean, I, I don't think there's any mechanism at the staff level to share. I mean, there there's nothing that says we should uh, negotiate with them in isolation. Um, so to the extent that we want to um, connect, to, and I would say probably at the staff level is best. We also have a Stanford ad hoc committee, but I think staff is really driving the process for us. I think being sharing our experience and our views and, with our colleagues at the city is can only be to the benefit of, of us. So I encourage you to do that. Dr. Austin, I encourage you to do that. Um, the other very, very minor thing is I saw in the paper that, um, what do we call it, uh, rail crossing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and there was a mention that, I guess, the viaduct option is, possibly, is coming back, possibly coming back. And the one thing, the, and, the, and the thing that I saw about it is it's in the paper that in part it was based on PAUSD 
input. Um, and that surprised me. Um, I just want to make clear that PAOSD, unless I missed a trick, has no official position. I didn't on, see anything to that. It was in the paper. Uh, I, I actually reached out to Janadi to find out where did it come from. He pointed me at a report. It, it's, I mean, it's in the bowels of the thing, but I just want to cut it off at that because I don't want people to think that we are, you know, we 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 withdrew from the stakeholder committee on this because we did not want, and we were only an observer while we were on because we do not think that we should have a a formal position on what kind of the city solves this particular problem. We're happy to share what our needs are. We're happy to share you know, kind of what what our logistics are, but I don't want people to think that the that the school district is kind of putting a thumb on the scale of, of this process. We are not. I'll just uh, follow up there that I, I wasn't, uh, I haven't been aware of uh, district input on the viaduct, but I will note that for instance, as we were looking at the Churchill crossings and uh, we're looking at um, having the bike and head dedicated separation that might uh, precede work on the vehicular one. One of the alternative locations was at Kellogg and it was very problematic. I agreed completely with the uh, district's concerns on that and most of us were agreeing that, that that's not best location, but uh, that had gotten that far along and money spent on that alternative and then uh, uh, concerned by uh, Don and others that it, it had real problems on uh, the backside of the, of the uh, football field area, just mm -hmm. uh, it, it was physically over constrained and would have impacts on the district. But those things go down a path like that in part because of lack of engagement by the district. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's, um, efficient, nor in the district's best interest, whether it's your interest on uh, 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 safety of, of students that are, you know, this is that butts district, uh, the, the Pali High, or down at um, just other safe routes to school issues, uh, or issues around your, your bus fleet access that could be impacted by alternatives that we're looking at. Um, so um, I, I continue to believe that um, both parties would benefit from uh, more engagement by the district on this. So. Any other comments, questions? Yeah, just quickly, yeah. debating this one. Um, any plan that was going to take our football stadium away, <laughs> the, the visiting side should have. I would think an average person would say that's probably not going to happen, and did not know that that was the plan. Take away the visitor side stadium. That was that was an outlier. But as far as engagement of the Churchill piece, uh, we have um, we've communicated that over and over again. I meet with Ed on that. We worked directly with the engineers on that also, so that if there is an uh, an underpass. That they work with our bus drivers, they have the turn radius, but that it all got worked out. So, I, engagement on a committee and, and not being engaged are two very, very different things. And we, we have a high level of engagement with the city and Chantal's on those meetings. And, and we do that, you know, separately with the engineers. So, I, th I think we've actually done a lot of work with the city on that. And again, if there was ever a thought that we're we're going to be okay with losing half of a stadium. I mean, that just that wasn't ever going to happen. So um, it doesn't mean we should should or shouldn't be on a committee. And I understand what you're saying, but I just don't want to confuse that with a lack of engagement. There's been a tremendous amount of engagement. Well, but um, for instance, that example that went down a path and had uh, an expensive consultant who did a lot of modeling on that alternative over a couple year period that it then came forward, um, that continued down that path uh, because uh, we hadn't received the pushback from uh, the district that I fully agreed with um, uh, during that process. So I'm not sure how to uh, reconcile uh, 
what you've described as that engagement, and yet we spent a lot of money needlessly on an alternative that uh, shouldn't have gone that far. And um, and uh, and I, you know, it was originally uh, not well thought through uh, from our consultant standpoint and others, but um, but ultimately the pushback from the district really had a strong influence on shutting down that alternative, which I was glad to shut down. No need to go. I mean, I think I think we. I, it's very useful to hear your perspective and, and having heard it in the past. And there's a good concrete example of what you're talking about. And I certainly understand your perspective as well, because we are engaged in many ways, but clearly we weren't engaged in the right way to cut off this one at the pass and save a couple of years of work. So um, there's a lesson to be learned there. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, let me ask if there's any public comment on the reports that we've just heard. Um, Chair, we have no requests to speak. Okay, thank you. All right, let's move on to our city and school collaborations discussion. This is a presentation from um, Mr. Collins, and I'd like to allocate 30 minutes for this conversation, all told. Sounds good. Am I driving? Yes. You okay. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> all right, so um, this, I'm going to give this brief presentation, which summarizes basically some thinking that I did a couple of years ago and you know Pat was instrumental in getting me thinking about some of these issues and the context is that you know we've had kind of this long we have a long we have a, we have a long standing relationship a permanent relationship really that's built up over time in various ways um, and it's kind of built up in a ad hoc manner as issues come up we come up with mechanisms to address them um, and the question is whether this sort of built ad hoc built up approach is the approach that we want or whether a better approach, a different approach would serve us better because they're all explores some other models that uh, others have used to address the relationships between government agencies. So with that, let me just start. So the history here is interesting. I, you know, it's funny because I vaguely know, most of us vaguely know most of this, but it was fun researching to get some of the details of when things started and how they came to be. Um, you know, we've got a whole stream of things that started in uh, the 70s with uh, offering preschool and through PACCC and later after school programs with the same organization. And we've been partners between the city. And that really started the, the preschool uh, PACCC really started with uh, parents women re-entering the workforce in the late 60s and early 70s, wanting more childcare options. If they're bad now, if the market now is bad, imagine what it was like in 1972. And then, uh, and, and coming to the city to say, can you help us sell that? And the city stepping up and um, helping first with early childhood care, preschool care, and then later uh, expanding into after school care. So we've been partners with that for going on 50 years. Um, then we've got a long history of what I guess I would call real estate. Um, and as you guys probably know, we are all very acutely aware of, you know, we have a thing called the roller coaster chart, which represents enrollment in Palo Alto going back to 1950. Um, and it went up and up and up. I peaked at about 15, 16,000. Then it went down and down and down and down. Troughed at about 8,000, I think, in 1988 or so. And then went up and up and up and up and uh, peaked just recently, and now is going down the other side of the roller coaster. During that, and this first, certainly during the last of first grade melting, which by the way, the people at the time thought was permanent. They thought it was permanent. Um, they thought this represented a permanent change. And believe it or not, there I, I can find you quotes from the paper in 1980 saying, of course, people with kids could never live in Palo Alto again because it's too damn expensive in 1980. Um, so uh, one way that manifested itself is the city, uh, the school district started literally, I would say, burning the furniture. We started selling properties um, to uh, developers, um, to um, which generated housing in the in the community, but mostly generated funding for the schools. And so we were selling, doing these one-time transactions, selling, and 
And it wasn't just us, this was school districts all of America going through the same thing. One thing we did is we sold the Ventura site to you guys. I actually have a copy. You bought the 4.6 acres for $1.2 million, a little under about $300,000 an acre. Nice job. Um, the bad news is if you read the fine print, you have the right to buy it back. So, um, so you bought the Ventura site, you bought the Terman site. The Terman site was for a very long time city property. You passed in 1987, the uh, utility users tax, which while it was a general tax without a specific commitment, which of course would have quite a two-thirds majority, was in the ballot statements. And boy, if, if you ever want to have a fun read, go get the Coverly report from 10 years ago, the Coverly Advisory Committee, where some of the people on that committee did a fantastic job of collect, rating the archives and finding the, some of the seminal things. So including all the ballot measure arguments for the utility tax, which very explicitly included that this was going to be spent on, um, on Coverly and the covenant not to compete on a number of other, uh, not, not to develop rather, on a number of other sites. So that led to the Coverly lease and the covenant not to develop. That was both the Coverly, I learned this, I thought it was just Coverly. It was also a, about five elementary school sites also were covered by the covenant not to develop. So we had that and that initiated the Coverly lease that we still have today. And then we had the, I don't, I mean, to me, it, it, the most complicated deal ever worked out, which was uh, us, we, Stanford contributed $10 million. We swapped the eight acres at Coverly for an exactly, it was 7.97 acres at Coverly for 7.97 acres at Terman um, so that we could reopen and I never realized, Pat, you probably know this, Julie, you may know it as well. I bet you don't know. <laughs> is that the Mayfield soccer uh, site, the old site of the Mayfield school going way, way, way back, uh, was originally supposed to be, as part of that deal, was supposed to become the new JCC. Mm. That was the site for the J, that was going to become the JCC. And that was like built into the docks. And it's like, I don't, and I, I wasn't around. I don't know the thread. So I don't want to hear how. The JCC went from being at what was now the Mayfield soccer field to so being at the at where it is, the magnificent building that they have. So anyway, this very complicated deal was cooked up, and my hat's off to the the city. And if you want to talk about city school cooperation, I mean that had to be one of the absolute peaks because that was not a complicated deal to even conceptualize, much less execute. Uh, and we ended up reopening uh, Terman School with with, with that ten million dollars. And because that enrollment was rising. And it leads to the situation that I think most people, everybody at this table is aware of, but maybe many community members aren't, where we own the term and site that the buildings are on, but the playing fields behind are actually city park land, where we have, it literally says in the documents, first call. No, there's no definition of what first call means. I and mean, maybe, maybe we have to send somebody out there at six every morning to like say, I got this spot. Like, like on the beach when you go in, uh, to a crowded beach. Um, but we have, uh, the city owns the parkland behind, the playing fields behind Chairman. And that's obviously now a topic of conversation um, with, uh, with the current program. So anyway, we've had a, a very long and, and complicated history with, um, with those sites. And then and there have been other ad hoc things, the Safe, Safe Roots to School program that started in, in the early 90s. Again, with uh, parents coming to this, um, the schools, but again, mostly to the city to say, hey, we want to have four kids biking. We want to have uh, a environment where it's safe for them to bike. And then obviously, project, as most of us are familiar with Project Safety Net, which was funny, uh, which came together in, uh, as a result of the suicide clusters in the, about 10, 15 years ago. Um, so there's this, and then there are a number of other things, middle school sports, children's theater, our collaborative uh, use of pools and gyms and playing fields. And most recently, of course, our city employee access to PAUSD, which I got a nice report from Chantal earlier that there were 40 people on the information call. On the info call. On the info Varying call. Varying age group of children. So we're, 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 we're actually in the process of rolling that out and, you know, the latest the latest example of our alumni partnership. So that's what we actually do. What what do we call this? What what you know? It's like a rom com movie where the 
there's always the point of like, well, what is this relationship? Um, can we put a name on it? And, you know, um, oftentimes the nomenclature that's used is that we're partners. Um, but when I think of partners, you know, I, I put that definition there based on shared purpose, indefinite, deep, broad commitment, and most importantly, subjugating each party's interest to the interest of the partnership. And to me, that's what makes up like a marriage. That's what really defines the partnership is that the, the interest of the parties is subjugated to the collective. Um, and, I, and while that describes some aspects of what we do, I think in many cases, that's not what we are. We obviously have extensive interests outside the areas that we, uh, that we collaborate on. So are we neighbors? And I've used this nomenclature in, in talking about Coverly, and I think it is a useful framework for thinking about how we relate to Coverly. Um, based on physical adjacency, mm -hmm. usually temporary, though can be long-term, doesn't have to be permanent, usually isn't. Uh, commitment varies by issue. Your neighbor wants to build a fence that on, against your property. You're very interested and you want to be engaged. Your neighbor wants to, you know, repave his driveway or get some do something on the other side of his property. You're like, fine, good luck. Your neighbor wants to do something that impacts the collectively the access on your street or something about your neighborhood more broadly. You know, to handle, handle the street trees, something like that. Um, you may collectively get together and try to work with all your neighbors. So there's shared interests based on proximity and maybe other things, but many interests that are separate that don't engage. And I would say the guiding uh, principle there is self-interest. I mean, you're you're interested in your neighbor, partly because you like him, partly because he's your neighbor, but mostly because you're, you know, you know what happens at his house is probably going to impact your existence at your house, so you want to pay attention. So I actually think we're a combination of these things. Um, uh, we have intersecting purposes. We're definitely permanent, indefinite. I mean, that's one of the things I always think about is, you know, we're never going to have an existence separate from you guys. Um, commitment varies by area. Um, they're shared interests, but most interests are separate. And I think the the way I think about our relationship is it's based on enlightened self-interest. We don't, we're, we're definitely focused on the interest of our own entity, but we realize that what affects you affects us and vice versa. There is no way for us to thrive that you guys don't thrive. And I think the, the obverse is true. So I, uh, I I asked my wife, I came up with a, a term for this. I, I, uh, my wife told me it was a bad idea. I, I thought, I said, how about neighbors with benefits? My wife, <laughs> my wife told me, don't put that on the slide. So I didn't. Your wife was right. <laughs> <laughs> now you've said it. Okay. Yeah, I, now you can't, un you can't unhear it. Sorry about that. So the question I tried to answer when I thought about all these things was how can we work together to most effectively serve our youth and community? And the answer I, I came up with is we'll offer better services if instead of having this ad hoc structure that we have a single structure for coordinating activities. Because the ad hoc, well, you know, makes sense when you're just, we're, clearly the history has been that problem comes up and we come up with a solution. Sometimes that involves working together. But we haven't ever put those in a single framework where all those things can be addressed collectively. And I think that particularly leads to um, a lack of discussion about how things are, how costs and funding and, and responsibility for actually doing things get shared, which leads to like any um, relationship that doesn't uh, evolve with the time leads to frustration because uh, what the circumstances that led to things be set up one way 20, 10, 20, 40 years ago, may not be the right way to have it done today. Um, but there's no mechanism for ever addressing that. And never, there's no forum. And in fact, when you, it's just like a, when you have a, a relationship in a, with, with, to, uh, with your spouse and you don't talk very much, it's like, the problem is that the problems just pile up. And it's like, it's never a good, if you, if you raise a problem, it seems like you're maybe not being a good partner and you're complaining. And it's like, well, if you think that's a problem, I'll tell you about a problem. So there's a real sense that we kind of try to be good partners and keep and repress those frustrations. Um, when really to have a good partnership, we need to be able to, uh, to talk about things and change our behaviors and change our how we do things to move forward. And finally, I think we by sharing assets and expenses to the extent that we can, we usually will end up with lower cost solutions. Right now, I think we largely operate independently. And we don't get the benefit of um, both our extensive staffs and our and our physical assets. So just thinking about, so I went out and looked 
and said, what do people do about this? Where this obviously is not a unique problem with Palo Alto and we're just, and the people have done this before. Obviously we have our ad hoc model. Um, one model that's out there is uh, I'd call a master agreement model, which is basically a contract. And the contract, un unlike an MOU that covers just one area, sets up a framework for addressing all areas. And basically um, says, and then we'll talk, I'll give you specifically how Beverly Hills has done this, um, sets up a framework where every few years on a prescribed schedule using a prescribed process, all the issues are put back on the table. I, don't, I mean, not that different from negotiating with our bargaining units. It's like it, to make sure that the things are opened up and re-examined so that we don't get stuck on, on um, ways of doing things that about what they're used to the best. Um, there are other models, though. There's the collective impact model. Um, Project Safety Net is a collective impact model. This is very popular in the social sector. You know, groups getting together and and um, usually with some very light staffing, they, these collective impact models usually don't run, usually don't run programs, but they, um, they're they a bully pulpit and they coordinate the programs of others. So that's an, that's an interesting model. And a good example of that, aside from Project Safety Net, is a thing called Oakland Thrives, which brings together most of the entities in Alameda County, including the city of Oakland and a number of nonprofits, as well as government agencies, to try to coordinate their efforts around youth development in Oakland and Alameda County. And I've had a, a really good time calling into a couple of their board meetings, which are chaired by the mayor of Oakland, where they, I, I can't tell if they get a lot done, but they have a really good time doing it. That is a very in terms of community building among the, the uh, agencies and the players, it, it clearly is very effective because those people view themselves as collective impact of the way they think of the, what they do. Um, and finally, you can go all the way, and I remember uh, uh, Julie mentioned this in our first meeting, um, to what we call, a, what I call a joint venture or a joint powers authority. Now, interestingly, the examples I just gave, Beverly Hills and the uh, Oakland Thrives, both call themselves a joint power authority. They call themselves JPAs. Um, they were not what I would call JPA, in the sense that they do not create a new entity. They do not um, fund into some new entity. Um, and, and then the entity does not offer its own programs. A good example of what I really would call a JPA is Metro Ed. I don't know if anybody is familiar with Metro Ed. Metro Ed has been around since the 60s. It is a collective. Do you know Metro Ed? You should go down and see it. It's really cool. Um, it is uh, been around since the 60s, and it was done for CTE and adult education, career technical education and adult education. And it's a joint effort of five or six school districts in San Jose. And as you guys know, there are a lot of school districts in San Jose. Exactly. Yeah. There, I, there are two regional occupational centers in the entire state. I was in the JP and the other one. And we're not in theirs, but, but I've been on that facility. Yeah, which is beautiful, right? And they and then this is part of what they've done. They they fund all the, the agencies, form this new agency. They members of the of the board of the funding agencies sit on the board of the new agency. They all fund into it. So the thing has a robust budget, has its own staff, has its own beautiful facilities, completely dedicated to this task of of uh, career and technical and adult education. And they do, and I think all the people, all the funding agencies would agree. They do a much, much better job and offer much better options than any of those school districts could do independently. So to me, that's really, you know, that kind of joint venture approach is at the other end of the spectrum. So my, my view is, you know, as I think about these for us, if the master agreement is the one that's worthy of consideration. I think the, the other two, while they, are, they definitely have uses, the JPA feels like a heavy, very heavy lift and maybe more than we need for just a two agency collaboration. And then, uh, and JPAs, as you guys know, often, you know, don't always accomplish their objectives as well. I, I pointed at a success story, but you've been pointed at others that kind of have struggled to succeed. Um, and the bully pulpit of a uh, collective impact model, well, again, might be useful for other things, probably doesn't address the operational needs that we have for coordination. So I come back to this master agreement approach. Um, and, you know, I, I think I've already gone over this. The, the reason is that ad hoc pro probably isn't enough. We run into trouble with our ad hoc approach and then the funding arrangements, shared costs. And with a coordinating platform in place, and this is interesting because we'll see this when we look at Beverly Hills briefly. 
when you have this kind of mechanism in place, it encourages you to add new things to it. Right now, I think we view, I, I, can, I, I know I can speak for myself. When I think of setting up a new initiative to collaborate, collaborate with the city, it feels hard because everything is has to be done. We have to work it all out from scratch. You know, it, 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 and then you, I'm sure you guys feel the same. It's like the, so much easier just to do it on our own. And, but if you have a mechanism like this in place, it takes some of the administrative burden off of standing up new, new joint initiatives. And when we look at Beverly Hills in a minute, you can see they have thrown the kitchen sink into their, um, what they call their GPA, their, their uh, master agreement. And they coordinate all kinds of things that we kind of don't even think of as coordinating. They coordinate and, and adjudicate through this administrative agreement. So I thought it was interesting because I, I hadn't really realized that that was one of the impacts, but I really think it is. Um, so I've talked about Beverly Hills. They have a, they, it's an MOU. You can, and this is all, I've got the, if you've got the printout, the links are on there. And if they document everything they do really well. It covers all aspects. Every aspect of the relationship between the city and the schools is covered in this. They designate point people within the administration. So there's ever any anybody anywhere in the organization that feels like things aren't going the way. They know who to talk to to get it adjudicated. And that person has a face off. Um, it's revisited and negotiated every three years via a pre-established process. The process for negotiating it is written into the MOU. There are committees on each side. They point a certain amount of uh, of stakeholders, those committees have meet every month, starting I think a year and a half before the the thing ends up. They propose something and they they take it back to their bodies. It's all written in, and they've been doing it now I think since the '80s. So they've got a really good rhythm. And when you talk, I talked to a couple of people in Beverly Hills about it, and I thought maybe they'd say, "Yeah, we're really proud. We've got this great thing." They're like, "Oh, that old thing? Yeah. I mean, yes, it's a it's central to what we do, but they just think of it as part of the furniture." Uh, I, I would dare say they don't, they would think if they, if we said, well, would, what, what would happen if we took it away or it blew up? They were like, how would we do things? They would literally like struggle to think about how they would do that. Um, and the major elements include, and I won't read these all off, but you can read them. I mean, they have included everything that we do, plus a bunch of other things that we never even thought of. Access to library for uh, school libraries for kids who don't go to the public schools. Um, city use of parking lots, city uses of the schools for emergency preparedness drills, um, distribution of city promotional materials. That's what you were just talking about, about sustainability. And I remember, I mean, this happens not on, uh, not uh, infrequently is that, uh, and I'm sure it happens to, it happens to me. I hear from Pat or somebody saying, Hey, I would really like to get the word out about X, Y, Z to the schools. How do we do that? And I'm like, I don't know, call the PTA. I mean, I, I don't know. And and we, the fact is, we just don't, that's not a thing that we do. But here, they do it by contract. It's like, you don't have to ask. There's a there's an established process for you to do that. And then, and I think if there were, if that's something we wanted to do, that's something we could build in some ways. So, oh, and school provided PD for preschool. They, they run the preschool program. The city runs the preschool programs there. The school provides the PD, professional development, for the preschool teachers. So a lot of interesting things that, you know, that we probably could do if we wanted to, um, but with the high tax on trying to do new things, we probably would steer clear if we didn't have anything like this. So, oh, and there are the, sorry, there are the things if you want to find out more about. So uh, just to include, so I did all this work two years ago um, and I was hot to trot. I thought it was a good idea and it was something, you know, we had discussed it in the 2020 campaign and it was something, I went and talked to not a whole lot of people, but people on both sides. One, the reason I stopped talking about it is the feedback I generally got was that seems like a lot of work. Putting that kind of agreement puts it seems like a lot of work. And while we've got, I guess maybe this is my own read into it. I think of our negotiations around Coverly as separate and apart from all these other operational programs. It's just a one-off kind of deal. It's big. It involves a lot of money. It's gone on a long time. We've got, you know, kind of big things that we want to do. I don't think of that as being a part of this agreement. That would be something outside. I think what, if you took Coverly aside and said, how do the city and uh, school district collaborate? 
most people would say at least okay. And they wouldn't say it's a big problem. That would be my view. Um, I think we could do better. But, you know, the question is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is this the area that we want to go spend a bunch of time on to try to work on a master agreement and then set up this process? Or do we want to just work on other things and kind of move through? So that, I don't know the answer to that, but that was the kind of pushback and it, and, and it slowed me down. I, I, I tapped the brakes on this because I, I heard from people that did not share my sense of enthusiasm. So anyway, that's, that's what I had to share. Thank you so much for Thank that presentation. You. Appreciate it. Let's let's just have a free flowing conversation. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I thought that was a great great presentation for a couple of reasons. I mean, I've also been thinking about this since 2018, and in 2020, Todd and Pat had started this uh, list of, of you know sort of a primordial framework for what we might do, and that was when I took your place on this committee, you know, and we worked together on that a little bit, but you know. There was no, there was no next step. There was, you know, that was what it was because next step was, uh, well, it was COVID. Right, right. We COVID, and so you know, the, the evolution of that was sort of stymied a little bit. Um, earlier this year, we had a discussion in this committee about what the role of this committee is, and sort of, you know, a resurgence of the idea of what, what is the relationship between the two bodies, and how do we move forward? So, I think the ideas that that you have, Todd, are you know, natural evolutions of what we've been trying to do for years. And I think I've been stopped for um, some good reasons, some bad reasons, but, you know, to me, it makes sense to put in the work because otherwise we are going to be in the same position we've been in for the last couple of years, sort of in perpetuity, where every year or two years when the, the committee uh, membership rotates, there'll be a discussion about the joint issues that the district and the, the council have. Uh, there'll be discussions about where balls have been dropped or where there, you know, folks have missed the mark, and then there'll be a commitment to you know, let's work together better. And then it, it's fine. That's sort of the way things have been going. But something like this would be, I think, as Todd said, a much cleaner way, much more comprehensive way. Um, and you know, I tend to agree that Carberly doesn't necessarily need to be a part of that. Um, but I, yeah, I like the model, the Beverly Hills. I wonder. You know, is, is the governance for the Beverly Hills model and the oversight committee, is that made up of members of the political bodies or staff? Um, the negotiation includes both staff and electives. So they, and it's like two, I, I think their numbers were not the same as yeah. so they had two from two electives and then a couple of staff people and maybe outside the stakeholders, I can't remember. But it's it's all written, but what's nice, I mean, it's, it clearly knew what they were doing. Yeah. So. They, they dialed it all right into the room. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we ought to we ought to follow Todd's Todd's lead and start thinking about this seriously. Um, so I agree, and uh, I really want to thank Todd for kind of framing this range of uh, approaches. Um, uh, you know the. the the, you mentioned this description of joint power authority, and I, so I'm curious on whether they are a true joint power authority, because joint power authority is a specific uh, legal entity under California law, uh, just like a special district is. And uh, so I don't know if they're misusing the uh, I, it, it, The document itself is an MOU. Yeah, there's basically an MOU. Yeah. And I don't know, they, I, it, it, they call it everywhere a JPA. But I didn't detect any JPA actually. In Interesting. Case. Okay. Um, and um, uh, so I, I, I agree with kind of the, the direction of uh, exploring some form of a master agreement. As I reflect on kind of what's happened from when we started uh, exploring this, I, I think it really, the, the COVID disruptions basically took the air out of the room. And um, and we're now both entities are kind of back fairly normalized and uh, and gives us an opportunity to do that. And it's also a question of uh, how to what extent the leadership of the electeds um, uh, were oriented this way. And we kind of had uh, a mixture uh, and, uh, amongst the, the members of this committee on on both parties. Uh, as to how enthusiastic it was, but 
uh, I suspect this group uh, is more aligned than we've uh, been the last couple of years on that. So between getting normalized and being philosophically aligned, um, I think that's really good. I would I would say that I, I think of it as more than enlightened self-interest, although there's certainly that element. But I've always thought of it as also the way that we address the overlapping missions of our organizations, which are both uh, about serving youth and families in our community, mm -hmm. uh, but not with identical uh, focus areas and priorities and primary purposes, but they do have that, that very strong overlap in that, that higher level uh, uh, purpose. Um, and, um, and then uh, I'm glad you explained the uh, professional, the, the acronym PD is professional development, because I was trying to figure out what the police department. <laughs> ah, 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 sorry about that. Yeah, yeah uh, something different for you guys. And uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, they send the police into the they send the police into the preschools there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So um, <laughs> top down. So I, I, uh, I'm with you. Um, I think the framing of this is right, and and uh, that some form of a uh, a master agreement and an ongoing um way that we we uh, uh, function within that um along the lines of what you described uh, whether it's the beverly hills model or some other variation of that um uh i i don't know but i i'm i'm really interested in uh, moving forward i think it's you know, way overdue uh decades overdue as a community uh, and we, in a way, when we, when the, we had the terrible disruptions of the uh, enrollment decline over a decade or more, um, the city and the district were functioning uh, without creating this ongoing body. They did a lot of this master agreement kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh, to try to contend with what our district and, and other districts were uh, going through a decade of kind of crisis uh, and how did we, how did we, would we continue to have the support that our students needed? Um, so it was never formalized and therefore, you know, and it, it kind of went by the wayside, but there was a, uh, there, there was still some people in town who were deeply involved and that's how we got all these set of agreements and utility users tax and whatnot. It was all within kind of a similar mindset uh, but um, putting it together in a way that that makes it uh, enduring and having some form of structure, uh, I think is a great concept. Okay, so I'm hearing a lot of agreement, which is fantastic. And I think I'm hearing maybe a motion is forming in somebody's head. Um, what I think I'd like to do is table the next agenda. We we're going to talk about the frequency of our meetings. There isn't a lot of time left to discuss that. Um, and I'm saying this now because maybe it'll factor into the motion um, in terms of what, what we are doing next. We are all on some kind of break for the coming five or six weeks. I believe our next meeting would naturally be August, right? So we're looking ahead to our August meeting as the next one. Um, does somebody want to make a motion about related to this topic about uh, what we're going to do next? Well, I I would suggest that we we make this our primary agenda item of the next meeting, and within that we have a discussion on whether we are ready to make uh, proposals to our respective bodies to not to adopt this, but to get their endorsement on exploring it. Uh, and because I think it's a, a multi-step process, uh, I don't know what are your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't take it for granted that there's going to be an enthusiastic reception. Um, and I also think it's important to get staff to work with this. I mean, it, it, it's easy for us to kind of say let's whistle up a, a mechanism, but the staffs actually got to implement it, and they implement most of what we do today. And so they may have a different perspective on them. And you know, one other uh, just comment on kind of the advantage of this kind of approach. We do have all a, a, a whole series of staff engagements on ad hoc issues, and um, and they're they but they 
they're less kind of that strategic relationship, although there's kind of maybe that implication in those discussions. But I think about, uh, you know, that the tendency to get pushed into kind of this transactional negotiation on things as opposed to this collaborative. Uh, and, you know, when the city in 2020 had its budget crisis and, and basically came to the district with its own determination of what uh, the city wanted done. And I just don't think that approach is uh, uh, the one that we are best served by and would happen if we had something like this in place. It would, it would at least be easier. Um, it, would, it, it, it felt abrupt, right? That's, that's the thing. I think when we try to do new things, when something comes up, it feels abrupt. And this may make it somewhat less abrupt. Yeah. Okay, so I think if we're simply making this our next, our, the, the primary agenda item in August, then we don't need a motion. We'll just direct right. that to the right? Put this on um, the master agreement concept uh, um, as our main agenda item. Um, I think we should, we can talk offline about what kinds of documents to bring forward to prepare us uh, to have that conversation, certainly diving more into what Beverly Hills does. Um, thank you for providing that link, Todd. Um, so I think that's where we are. Are we good? Sure. Yeah. 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 And okay. I, and I think this, at least for August, answers the question of do we have a meaningful purpose other than just get together and <laughs> ask how our expectations work? Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Um, uh, we will table the com the uh, topic of community meeting frequency to a later date and um, future business. Is there anyone, does anyone have a topic that they want to put on the future business agenda? I think this is it, but yeah, we're good. Did you want the meeting frequency in August as well? Or you want to kick that in the future? Let's kick that. Yeah. And the frequency came up in response to the question of do we have a need to meet? We are now identifying a very needy topic that we can make real progress on. So we can table that. Indefinitely at this point. Um, um, Chair, we do have one public, public comment. Thank request. you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm on another one. Good morning, everyone. This is Lee Fab from Palo Alto Community Child Care. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Um, as a community leader in Palo Alto, I just really want to thank you for the discussions that have happened over the last a couple meetings about the evolution of this group. Um, I also want to thank uh, the school district for the recognition of the sustained relationship that PAC has had between the city and the school district for 50 years next year. This sustained relationship has evolved over the years and we continue to need to evolve so that we can meet the needs of early child education in Palo Alto and after school programming. Our board is significantly focused on our strategic plan for the future and a couple items that I think are important for both the city and the school to know is that we understand that there is going to be more need for childcare and accessible childcare for our new families that'll be moving into Palo Alto through the housing element and the partnerships of uh, low income and below market housing in Palo Alto. I really look forward to being invited to some conversations around how are we going to serve these new families who are coming into our community. And I also want to uh, share that PAC is um, a community organization that represents families from zero to five uh, to fifth grade. And we do have access to providing information or sharing surveys, any other supports that we can do as you look at the next generation of your group. Thank you so much for allowing me to uh, share some feedback and I look forward to continued relationships um, and how we're gonna serve our families as a community. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. No further comments. I mean, commenters. All right. Thank you. Then uh, our meeting is adjourned. Okay.